allow me to introduce you to Fred the Talking Head. Hello. I'm the very embodiment of political comment, even if I am a little off my head. Today we're going to have a look at extracts from a speech by our Chancellor of the Exchequer, a Scotsman in a Scottish seat with little clout in his own country or constituency. He delivered this on the 8th of November at Scotland's Stirling University. His lot at Westminster are terrified of their fellow Scots going for independence because all of them would lose their very lucrative jobs. They're in a delightful catch-22 situation because they need to tell the Scots just how much cash they're shoveling over the border in order to bribe them to stay in the Union. But they also recognise that they can't give the true story because the English are out there listening as well. So they have to tone down the true extent of the looting or the English will go for independence and sling their miserable hides out anyway. Now Darling, Brown, Reed, Gorbals, Mick, the Speaker of the House, along with a lot of influential Scots MPs are in reality the real Scottish Nationalists, but they cannot say so. They have signed a public oath called the Scottish Claim of Right, and under that they're bound to put the interests of Scotland above all others. Now you can't get more of a Nationalist than that, can you? Our MPs find it in their interest to remain British, otherwise if they signed an English version of that oath, the Scottish leaders of the three main parties would deselect them and they would lose their lucrative jobs. So the Scottish MPs are looking after themselves and their people, while the English Judas MPs are looking after themselves only. Now I say that, but I must exclude a very, very small handful, which includes Peter Luff, Markfield and Frankfield and they are doing the best they can under very difficult circumstances without any support whatsoever from the other 550 English MPs that are selling their souls in Westminster. Anyhow, let's listen to our mate Alice to squirm in frustration trying to tell his constituents in Scotland just what he and his mates are thieving from the English while looking over their shoulders and hoping that we aren't listening. But we are. Now remember our darling signed that binding oath called the Scottish Claim of Right and he's an honourable man and you can hear now how he's sticking to every word of that oath. Notice how many times he uses the word Scotland and contrast that with their use of the word England in speeches in England and how much they use the word British down here, they dare not use it in their homeland. Now his speech included. I believe that it would be a profound mistake to spend the next four years in constitutional conflict north and south of the border when we need to meet the economic challenges we face. Now that's rich. Bear in mind that he played a key role in fomenting this conflict in the first place by fighting like hell for Scottish self-determination and now he's blocking ours. He continues. There are some who argue that Scotland's biggest challenge is constitutional. Our relationship with England, they're wrong. As I shall argue, I believe that Scotland and England are better off together than apart. Especially at this time when all over the world new opportunities are arising, which we can seize, if we have the will to do so. Scotland has always been a country that has looked out to the world and its economic opportunities. And especially, I would say, economic opportunities in England, the land of milk and honey, where the natives never saw the need for soldier bees to guard the hive. He continues, It was J. M. Barry, the Scottish novelist most famous for writing Peter Pan, who nearly a century ago said, There are few more impressive sights in the world than a Scotsman on the make. I think he's bragging here about the Labour Party. If he considers that to be complimentary, he has a severe comprehension problem. Oh, I forgot, of course. In his job, it's a prerequisite. He says, In the last century, John Logie Bear, the television, Sir Alexander Fleming, penicillin, Robert Watson Watt, Radar, and more recently a university spin-out company in my own constituency in Edinburgh designed the chips used in iPods. 
Now this brings us to a very important point. And what we're talking about here is university research funding. And it is tremendously important. In England, we get the grand sum of £3,500 per student. In Scotland, they get 5500 Nearly twice as much. Another way of looking at it is this. Scotland had 7.5% of new graduates, yet received 12% of all UK taxpayers' funded research monies. Result? High-tech spin-off companies to build up Scottish business, employment and wealth. Another snippet. Having one-tenth of Britain's population, Scotland has 25% of Britain's billionaires. And that's a phenomenon that's taken place in the last ten years under the Blair government. Alistair continues. Today, after ten years of economic growth in the United Kingdom, Scotland has the highest income per head in the United Kingdom outside London and that southeast area. Now a good question here is, then why do they need the £30 billion of English money courtesy of the Barnet formula? Why do they keep taking it? Why do they keep pushing it over the border? Oh, did you solve the Morse message at the beginning of this little programme? If not, go back and give it a try. Cheerio. Off with his head. <laughs>